Welcome to Health and Veritas. I'm Harlan Krumholtz. And I'm Howie Foreman. We're physicians and professors at Yale University. We're trying to get closer to the truth about health and healthcare. This week, we'll be speaking with Dr. Carrie Gross. But first, we always like to check in on current health news. And I know there's a paper that you wanted to talk about today, Harlan, so I'm eager to hear about it. Yeah, I like to talk about papers that get a lot of national attention. And, and of course, when papers are published about weight, uh, they tend to, to catch people's eyes. There was a paper that came out this week that was looking at the association of a change in, in body size, and in, in, including weight, with all-cause and cause-specific mortality, causes of death, among healthy older adults. And, and people might have seen headlines that was something like, you know, losing weight isn't good for you if you're older. And, you know, this paper was a little more nuanced than that, so I just thought I would take a quick, a little deeper look for people can get some perspective on this. So this was a group that that really was asking this question, is change in body size associated with a change in mortality risk among healthy older adults? And what they did was they made use of a, of a study. We call this a post hoc analysis. Essentially, you do one study, but you end up having a database that you can use for other studies. So this study was, was one about whether aspirin reduced risk in, in older people. And it was a randomized clinical trial, and they recruited people from 2010 to 2014. And they, they were particularly recruiting people 65 and older in the U.S. and actually 70 and older in Australia. And, and then they followed them up for a period of time. And, th and they finished that study. But, but the question then with this data, they, they could take advantage of it because it turned out that in this study, body weight and waist circumference were measured at, at the baseline visit when they first started the study. And at a regularly scheduled visit two years later. And then what they were able to do was to say, how about, you know, the changes that occurred in body weight and waist circumference, you know, what your belt size was essentially. And, and how did that relate to the risk of, of dying and not just dying from anything or dying from some, something like cancer? So they had about, I don't know, 16,500 people that were in this study. The, the mean age, the average age was 75 years old, and about half of them were women. And, and over the course of about a little more than four years, they had over 1,200 deaths. So 1,600 people, 1,200 deaths. And then they, they started looking at people who had stable weight over those first two, those first two visits, those who had a 5 to 10% weight loss, and then those who had more than a 10% weight loss. And they they took a look at what how it affected mortality. Now, now again, this is not, these were healthy older adults, but these, they weren't looking at them by whether they were trying to lose weight. They were looking at them by whether they did lose weight or they lost belt size, for example. And what they saw was that in men, compared to those who had a stable weight over that period, those who had a 5 to 10% weight loss had a 33% higher risk of dying. And those who had more than a 10% decrease in their weight had almost a three times, a 300% higher risk of dying. Now, women similarly had increased risk with those weight losses, but they weren't quite as large as the, as the increase in risk that were experienced by men. And uh, when they also looked, for example, at uh, you know, different causes, they saw the weight loss was associated with a higher cancer-specific mortality, and you know, both uh, in men and in women. Uh, and when they looked at non-cancer, also among men who had greater than a 10% decrease, there was also an increase. This was, and by the way, the waist circumference followed what you might have expected from the weight. Now, you just need to know something, which is that, again, this isn't about people who are grappling with obesity and whether they lost weight. And we do have a lot of questions about what, what about people who are older who have obesity? Should they be undertaking particularly with medications now available. I mean, how should this fit into our way in which we're treating obesity? But, but this is just about whether people are losing weight. And, and so when you read about this, it's not that, that, first of all, people shouldn't freak out if they've lost weight. And it also doesn't mean that if you purposely follow a plan to get healthier, and that involves losing some pounds, that that might be put you at higher risk. This is about people who showed up two years later and and what, what you have to take into account is that a lot of people lose weight because they were sort of losing appetite or, yeah, or, or yeah. maybe becoming what we call hypercatabolic. Their body was sort of using calories more maybe because they it was sort of before they developed cancer, something was happening. What 
This is something we've known for a long time in medicine. How a patient shows up with yeah. unexplained weight loss, a lot. we, we yep. pay attention, right? Yep. Yep. No, it's interesting. And, and also, uh, you know, patients that are depressed are prone to that? weight loss, and they're also prone to a lot of other disorders. So there's a lot of correlation, not necessarily causation, but it definitely is something that people should be sp uh, spending a little more time paying attention to. So I, I don't want people to fear uh, uh, taking on a healthy program where they start exercising a little bit more and lose a little bit of weight. That's not what this tested. This is more about the people that show up and and show pretty much unexplained weight loss. And, and when that happens, we need to pay attention to see if there's any problem. Again, even though there was an increased risk, I think, you know, it there were also a lot of people that didn't bother. It doesn't mean like everyone who had this got into trouble. It just right. means it, it, for some people, it was a, it was a signal of increase that they had, that right. there was something that, that then subsequently happened. But anyway, I just wanted to clear it up. So people didn't just all of a sudden think it's great. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, I shouldn't be eating healthier cause that might hurt me. You know, it's like, that's <laughs> right. not, that's not what was in this study. No. Hey, let's, let's pivot to get to Carrie. What a great guest. And uh, we'll get to your introduction. Dr. Cary Gross is a professor of medicine and public health at Yale School of Medicine. He's the director of the National Clinician Scholars Program, which is dedicated to fostering leadership and providing mentorship for future clinicians. And he's the founding director of the Yale Cancer Outcomes Public Policy and Effectiveness Research Center, or COPPER. His research focuses on healthcare effectiveness, quality, and health equity, concentrating on cancer prevention and treatment. Dr. Gross also serves as an associate editor for JAMA Internal Medicine. He received his bachelor's degree at Johns Hopkins University and his medical degree from NYU School of Medicine. He completed his residency in internal medicine at New York Hospital Cornell Medical Center and served as chief medical resident at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center before moving back to Johns Hopkins to complete the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program. So first, thanks very much for joining the podcast. Uh, before you arrived at Yale, uh, you published a paper on the association or, or lack thereof of burden of disease with NIH funding. Um, you followed this up two decades later. Um, can you tell us what you learned then, what you know now, and and what our listeners can take home from that? Yeah, first of all, thanks, Howie and Harlan, for having me on the podcast. I'm a big fan of the podcast, and more importantly, big fan of, of yours. I uh, really appreciated our friendship and, and collaboration over the years. Um, when I was a chief resident at Sloan Kettering, I was a primary care doctor, but as a chief resident, I really grew, not only as a clinician, but I grew as, as a skeptic of the research process. I, I really saw a lot of the focus naturally in Sloan Kettering, what was on uh, cure, curing cancer. But I really began to wonder, what, uh, what are we really trying to do with, with, with our research studies? What are we trying to accomplish with our research ecosystem. So when I was a fellow in the clinical scholars program, some colleagues and I initiated a study where we looked at the how the NIH was allocating funding to specific diseases. And the question was whether the burden of disease on society, which you could measure burden of disease in a variety of ways, number of deaths, number of years of life, life lost, costs, et cetera. So we looked at the relation between burden of disease through various metrics and how much the NIH was investing in research on these different diseases. So what we found was that there was a weak correlation between burden of disease and how much the NIH is funding, spending on different diseases. But we also found there was gross overspending in relation to disease burden for some conditions, such as breast cancer, um, AIDS, uh, dementia, diabetes, Again, not against research on those diseases, but by contrast, other diseases with large burdens were very much understudied, uh, perinatal disease, emphysema, et cetera. Another finding from the same study, we, you know, I mentioned that we looked at different ways of measuring disease burden. What we found is that the, the way you define burden, if you pick one metric, such as deaths, you, your disease of interest may come out looking really underfunded. And you pick a different metric, you know, maybe it's cost, then your disease may look overfunded. So we really try to point out that uh, advocacy groups and, and scientists could potentially game the system uh, when advocating for their diseases. You know, uh, I think on Howie's introduction, 
Well, uh, what's good, I want to just add to it a little bit that, you know, you're really one of the most creative uh, investigators that I know. You, you think broadly about a wide range of issues and have made contributions across a wide range of medicine and healthcare. And, and a lot of your, your work is truly actionable. I mean, it has changed practice, it's influenced guidelines, it's, it's helped make medicine better, and you're a terrific mentor. I just want to use this platform to say out loud what a pleasure it's been for me to be able to work with you. And, and uh, it's one of the great privileges of our work in academia that we get to have colleagues like you who, who help inspire us and, and push us to do ever better and, and are such a good example about how, how good it can be uh, in academia to try to help others. I, I want to just talk to you about some of the work that, that you've done and its practical implications. For example, you've written a lot about when we should stop screening for cancer. You know, wh when is the time that we can start telling people you no longer have to go through a colonoscopy, for example. Uh, and you, I know you've thought deep about, you know, a wide variety of other screening tests, mammography and so forth. So, so what is it? What's the answer here? You know, wh how old do you need to be that you don't need to worry about screening? And, and does that really make sense given the cancer rates increase with age? So people listening might wonder, gee, I don't think I should stop. You know, how, how do you explain your research to them and, and its implications? Yeah, it's a great question. One way I think about um, screening older patients for cancer is to first of all think about this issue of overdiagnosis. That if you have a small tumor that you, you're not feeling symptoms from, not showing up on routine tests, and you find it on cancer screening, whether it's colonoscopy or mammogram, what have you, if you find this small tumor, the real question is would that tumor have caused you any problems? in the rest of your life, or would you have died of something else first and been none the wiser about the fact that there was a, a smoldering small cancer in there? So the, the real question is almost like it's a race between if there is a small cancer there, would it cause any problems, or are you better off not knowing about it? Because Is it a problem with that word cancer? Because anybody who knows that I've actually got a cancer doesn't naturally want to feel like I think I'll just ignore it, right? So is it is is it part of our terminology? Also, yeah, I mean, this is cancer and exceptionalism, I think, in our research and ecosystem, and also in our health, health, healthcare ecosystem. Cancer is a condition people were afraid to even say the word, you know, in the 50s, 60s, 70s. It was a horrifying word. That's why we have the National Cancer Act. We don't have the National Gout Act, right? It's the National Cancer Act. People are, are scared. It has a tremendous disease burden. So they want to screen for it. A, 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 a few people want to want to treat a cancer if they have it. They want to know, that, know whether it's there. But for the older patients, if you have a short life expectancy, uh, it's highly unlikely that short life expectancy meaning less than 10 years, it's highly unlikely that screening for cancer is going to do more, more benefit than it is harm. It's most likely if there is a cancer there, it wouldn't cause you any problem. So, so, so and just to finish this then, so who do you recommend not, not getting screened for, for these cancers? Yeah. What, what, I mean, because you know the truth is, Carrie, you say less than 10 years. I, I think if you're 95, you still think you're gonna live more than 10 years. Like nobody thinks I've only got 10 years yeah, left. I mean, most people, I mean, if you've, got a, if you've got a terminal disease, but aside from that, I mean, so people don't wanna think about that in that, those terms. Yeah, there's a tension between thinking quantitatively and thinking qualitatively, right? So quantitatively, you could say, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but you could say if you're 90 years old, you only have a 5% chance of living 10 years, right? But people think qualitatively, and they think, I'll roll the dice. I want to be in that 5%. So I think at the end of the day, we have to give people the, the, the information to let them make an informed choice. But um, so, so in some instances, the harms are really going to outweigh the, weigh the benefits, and you have to make sure people know that. I'm just so I'm, I know, Howie, I'm taking up. I'm going to hand it off to you in a second. I just want to pin you down on this. So what do the guidelines say based on a lot of it based on some of the research you've done? When do they say people should stop A screening? lot of them say less than, well, it differs by cancer type. Like, for instance, prostate cancer, I don't know that we should be screening anyone, to be honest. Uh, that's a different uh, different topic of conversation. Things like breast cancer screening, colorectal cancer screening. Generally saying, if you're speaking, if you're over the age of 75, you should not be screening. However, if your life expectancy is greater than 10 years and you really in, are making an informed decision, it's not unreasonable to be screened, but uh, it didn't, it, okay, we, we, we purport to be practicing evidence-based medicine. These t 
tests have never been shown to improve survival in this age group at all. So we have to start off by telling people that over the age of 75, we have no idea whether this is going to help you. But that being said, I think we could um, make a strong argument that the vast majority of patients are not going to be helped by screening over that age. You have, um, you know, you talked about screening for cancer, and that's an area that naturally fits into the typical domain of a primary care physician and a primary care research scholar. But you've spent a huge chunk of your career doing research more broadly in the oncology space, um, including topics of technology diffusion, meaning whether um, new technologies get out into certain populations or certain communities earlier or later. Can you, and you did your chief residency, I think you said, at a Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, can you tell us a little more about how you've built a career in oncology, even as being a primary care physician, and what you've learned? What are the big lessons? Mm-hmm. First of all, I've learned the importance of collaboration. So not being an oncologist, I feel has always been an advantage for me working in the oncology space. Because luckily, at a place like, like Yale, there are a multitude of really talented clinician investigators who, who treat breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, and can help to actually um, suggest the more most important, uh, most clinically relevant and policy relevant questions. And, because I have a different type of training than most of my colleagues, who we are able to work together to craft these questions into something that's answerable. But what I really enjoy, uh, frankly, I've always had the perspective of being an outsider, outsider of medicine, or, um, outsider uh, in the world of, of oncology. And, and I think that has helped me to be able to ask questions that maybe people who are embedded within the cancer field all day, every day, are maybe not willing to ask or interested in asking. One paper that you've recently written uh, was really provocative. It was about whether we should be holding professional uh, society scientific meetings only in states that protect abortion rights. And, uh, you you know, we've seen this in in Major League Sports. uh, You know, of course, Major League Baseball moved the All-Star game from Atlanta, you know, at a time when there was some question about whether there was agreement with political policies in Georgia. Uh, Want to just talk a little bit? I'm just curious, you know, what, what... what, what are you thinking about this, and is this really a, something that we should be doing? Yeah, let's take a step back. I mean, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, where was the American Medical Association that we're trying to push for uh, uniform national health care? Where is the medical profession as a whole when we're dealing with or not dealing with systemic racism and understanding the profound barriers to, to care and profound barriers to education that institutionalized medicine was putting up. So when we're thinking about professional societies, let's really own it and say we've dropped, we uh, collectively have dropped the ball many times over the past century. So here's another ball. All of a sudden, several states are, are prohibiting abortion or uh, directly harming women or, or people who, who, who could be pregnant or directly harming the physician-patient relationship. So I would ask, where do medical professional societies, who are supposed to be upholding the standards of our profession, where, what are they doing now aside from issuing statements or not issuing statements? So, you know, one of the ways that uh, these professional societies uh, cultivate their norms and uh, disseminate new information is by having their professional meetings and uh, uh, annual big meetings, thousands of people come. You know, it's a big economic boom for the host, host city or, or host state. But most importantly, it's but, but some people will, but some people will argue that you know the natural extension can go into so many different areas, and the people that you're harming are the hourly workers who are you know supported by these large conventions who may largely have had nothing to do with that policy, may even disagree with that policy. And, and you know, in a place like you cancel Atlanta, which by the way would probably, as a city, you know, favor more towards you know uh, rights those rights than not, but, you know, are in a state where other regions are, are against it. I mean, how do you balance that? Yeah, I mean, there's two arguments you're bringing up, right? There's the um, slippery slope argument, and there's the what about people in those states argument. Let's pick the latter one first. I would say when you pick one place to hold a conference forever, Atlanta, by definition, 49 other states are losing out. 
right? When you make a choice, you're going to Atlanta. The people from New Orleans are like, I'm not getting that business. And 48 other states are all saying the same thing. So whichever state you pick, 49 others are, are left out. So I, I don't find the other states being harmed. Oh, that's good. I like as that. That's a good argument. The slippery slope argument, you know, it's always a tenuous argument. It's hard to argue with because someone could say, you know, gee, what about, um, I don't know, the variety of state policies that are harmful, like not expanding Medicaid. Somebody might say, we shouldn't go to states that didn't expand Medicaid because they're harmful. But my, my challenge with the slippery slope argument is you could use that to therefore never do anything, right? Because no matter how onerous a, a, a state policy is, you could say, I, I can't ever act because somebody could then say, well, you know, are there other policies that we should be acting on? So my thought is this one, the Dobbs decision, the, the, uh, the taking away that this constitutional right is onerous enough and, and specifically is harming patients and the physician patient relationship that we have to act. And are there other things that we should be acting on as a profession? Are there ways we should be acting? For sure, this is not the be all and end all, but our thought when we wrote this piece was that uh, this, this is just some, one way for us to uh, show some support for uh, for pregnant people and for and for a, a potentially pregnant people in our own profession, right? Who don't want to go to these states. And what if you have an ectopic pregnancy and you're, you're in a, you know, Texas and you can't get medical care? Um, so it, it, it's it's both an issue of um, upholding rights in the states that we're holding these conferences in, but also if you're sending people off to these states and, and you know you want to make sure they're going to a safe environment from a healthcare perspective. But I agree, it, it's a challenging question. I want to pivot to a, a different topic. Um, you know, I'm sitting here with the two of you, and both of you have this extraordinary track record of mentoring medical students and even undergraduates. Uh, and, and you, much like Harlan, you have a lot of papers with a first author, some of your most cited papers, in fact, first author is a medical student, and some of them have gone on to become full professors by now. And just for our audience who does not know how this process typically works, can you talk briefly about what it takes to lead somebody who may have never written a paper before through a process of of writing a highly cited contribution to the literature and maybe give an example or two if you want? Yeah, sure. I mean, first of all, being in a place like Yale, the trainees are so, so smart. I mean, I I didn't get into Yale. I can't believe I'm here now. But these are people who are all just so incredibly bright and motivated and are coming with such fantastic ideas. So um, yes, certainly mentorship takes work because they have, you know, they have the ideas that may not have the research methods or, 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 or the writing skills or experience, but uh, the, the energy and the passion uh, that, uh, that the students bring to the table and the creativity um, really makes it, frankly, a very, a very easy and joyful process. Uh, but what, what I find is that it's incredibly helpful to uh, have iterative meetings to understand what people are really excited about. Um, so frankly, sometimes to push them a little bit, push them both uh, conceptually to hone down on what is the research question, what are we trying to do, and push them a little bit to make sure they're leading the um, uh, leading the charge, to make sure that they are the ones who are providing momentum as opposed to being uh, reactive. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of graduating students this year. Um, uh, uh, Ryan Chow is a, a, a MD, PhD, MD, PhD student who just graduated. We looked at the uh, expenditures for cancer care in the U.S. versus uh, in other countries. We worked with Betsy Bradley, which is a friend of all of ours, um, and we found, uh, you know, uh, under under Ryan's leadership, we found that the U.S. has spent twice as much on cancer care as in other countries, but we're getting a subpar wow. outcome. So um, that's wow. the kind of study that uh, may not be surprising, but it's important to document, and the hope is that will help yeah. to lead to. Uh, future work in this area by others, but hopefully by Ryan. I guess that's one other, one other topic about mentorship. Yeah, trying to uh, lure people into our area and, uh, and focus on big picture policy questions and big picture clinical questions. Some people bemoan the state of of academia these days. Uh, what's your view? Are you thinking half full or half empty, or like how how are you feeling about the pressures and the opportunities that exist for people who are trying to do what you're doing? Yeah, I think it's half full. Uh, I think because it, you know, we, 
<laughs> it's funny how the dating back 20 years. Uh, you, you were such an optimist. You're always like, we're on the cusp of a new era. We're on the cusp of a new era. And we always are. Uh, and, and I think now, now we're on the cusp of a new era. I think there's, uh, there's widespread appreciation, unfortunately, thanks to COVID, um, of the importance of, pu of, of public health and thinking about the, uh, the broad ramifications of how our research is helping people. There's um, after the awakening post George Floyd's murder, there's a widespread understanding that we need to do something to address systemic racism. So at the same time, we're making these technological advancements. I think we're also making uh, philosophical, philosophical and conceptual advancements uh, that are really helping to engage a broader swath of potential researchers, helping to engage uh, community-based stakeholders to help, help, help to hold us accountable. So I think there are pressures, uh, uh, you know, financially, a lot, of, a lot of docs are also burnt out time-wise. Um, uh, hospitals are facing pressures, but I think the opportunities are so great uh, that uh, I think we'll figure it out. Look, Kerry, I just want to just echo what Holland said at the beginning. You are a, a jewel at Yale, and uh, I remember when you arrived here almost 24 years ago, um, you have delivered on every bit of promise when you came and you continue to be one of the most productive scholars that we have. So thanks very much for joining us and for being such a great friend and mentor to so many. Yeah, thanks so much. Really enjoyed having you and, uh, and appreciate you taking the time. Well, thank you both. I really enjoyed it as well. Well, that was a terrific interview and I really enjoyed having Carrie on. But Howie, this is actually my favorite part of the show, which I didn't <laughs> learn something from you and hear, hear your perspective on something this week. Uh, it's it's not my favorite part of the show, and I'm so <laughs> frustrated to even be coming back to this because it's hard to believe, but for the second week in a row, I'm going to talk about a legal case uh, that has come out of the Northern District of Texas. This past week, Judge Matthew Kaczmarek of Amarillo, in a 67-page ruling, stayed, or to put it a different way, undid the FDA approval of mifepristone, a drug that has been used in the United States for almost 23 years. This is the most widely used drug for medication abortion. It's 99.6% effective when used within 70 days of conception, has a very favorable safety profile, and by the way, 54% of all abortions occur with medication. The judge seemed to accept on face value many what I would call specious claims made by the anti-abortion groups that brought the case, including that mifepristone was approved in an overly speedy way, that it is not safe, and that its ongoing approval impacts them personally as plaintiffs. So few points that our listeners may be interested in. First, mifepristone was first approved in France in 1988, and it's been used worldwide for over 35 years now. President Clinton in 1993 first asked the FDA to study the drug, but it was actually difficult to get a manufacturer to pursue commercialization in the U.S. due to the risks of boycotts by anti-abortion groups and others. The year 2000, our colleague Jane Haney, who was then the commissioner of the FDA, oversaw the approval uh, of that, of mifepristone, and since that time, it has been subject to a higher degree of ongoing monitoring and scrutiny uh, because the FDA put that in place at that time. Dr. Haney, in fact, weighed in this week to dispute some of the statements of fact in this case, particularly that which says that this was somehow an accelerated approval. The risk of death from mifepristone is 0.35 to 0.65 per 100,000 patients. The risk of death from all abortions is approximately 0 0.7 per 100,000, suggesting that surgical abortions are actually higher risk than medication abortions. And the risk of death from live births, which we call maternal mortality, is 20 to 30 per 100,000, or 30 to 50 times the rate for medication abortion, and much higher than that if you're looking at select subpopulations such as those that are poorer or among people of color. Let's put that aside for a second. In a separate legal case brought in Washington state, a group of Democratic attorneys general were granted their motion to pause further restrictions imposed by the FDA on mifepristone use. This case seeks to undo recently reimposed monitoring and restrictions on mifepristone 
after the pandemic emergency passed. This case effectively maintains the status quo, but it's also in direct conflict with the Texas case. Both cases will likely be decided by the Supreme Court in the future, but my best guess is that the Supreme Court will issue a further stay of both rulings pending a hearing next year and then ruling on it at the earliest, I think, 15 months from now, or final ruling on it at the earliest 15 months from now. So the only risk, which I hope is low, is that the Supreme Court is unwilling to stay the Texas ruling until they have their own final ruling. So but let me take, put that aside for a minute and just remind our listeners, both cases should raise concerns in that they involve the courts in uh, dabbling in FDA approvals. The FDA process, which is under our executive branch, has been a highly legislated um, area of policy. Uh, it is respected worldwide. Uh, and we need the FDA to maintain that respect. In the former case, there is egregious overreach, in my opinion, in that it, there's a clear failure to abide by, uh, by precedents and legal reasoning and a misuse of facts and abject misrepresentations about a drug that has been widely and successfully studied for decades. I didn't want to mention it last week. We touched on it, but I, I didn't want to mention it. But I have to this week. Judge Kaczmarek of Amarillo was confirmed by a purely partisan vote of GOP senators, while Judge Rice of Spokane received nearly unanimous bipartisan approval. And it does raise the concern that this is mostly a partisan and ideological uh, argument that's being fought here. Yeah, uh, thanks for addressing this, Howie. It, it may seem like there's a lot of inside baseball in these court cases, but you know it does break down to being very clearly about Partisan courts intervening in in medical care and and abrogating some of the general standards from you know regulatory decision making that that have stood for years and years and years. And if the courts start stepping into this, you know, question again, when will it end? I also think it's about politics playing a bigger role in medicine than they have ever had before, and the courts getting involved as well as as uh, the legislatures. I mean, look at all the stuff going on around trans health and so forth. I mean, yeah. it's, it's beginning to put a chill on what doctors and patients can talk about and to put constraints on the ability of patients to decide for themselves about paths that they want to choose. And the real question will be, how will we mediate this in this country? Because it's just become just another battlefield, battlefield between Democrats and Republicans in ways that I think are going to end up making the public the losers in this. And and we really need to figure out how we're going to extricate this from this this, you know, just one more front on a on a war taking place between two parties and in very different views in America about what represents the the kind of life and culture that we should have. I, I will just add, if it's comforting to our listeners to know, the majority of GOP House members who are physicians and a majority of GOP senators who are physicians have not signed on to an amicus brief in support of Judge Kaczmarek's ruling, which gives me a little bit of comfort that at least our elected leaders recognize that this is not the right course for law. Yeah, and I think many Republicans realize that actually this is a poor path for winning elections because, you know, the, the way yes. in which, you know... Mo there are many Americans who don't agree with this, and it becomes a. Actually, I'm hopeful that it'll be self-correcting, as let's as hope. the elections show that that's not a winning strategy. Let's hope. But, yeah, but but thanks for raising that. You've been listening to Health and Veritas with Harlan Krumholtz and Howie Foreman. So how did we do? To give us your feedback or to keep the conversation going, you can find us on Twitter. I'm at H M K Y A L E. That's H M K E L. And I'm at the Howie. That's at T-H-E-H-O-W-I-E. You can also email us at health.veritas at yale.edu. Aside from Twitter and our podcast, I'm fortunate to be the faculty director of the Healthcare Track and founder of the MBA for Executives program at the Yale School of Management. Feel free to reach out via email for more information on our innovative programs, or you can check out our website at som.yale.edu slash EMBA. Health and Veritas is produced with the Yale School of Management and now also with the Yale School of Public Health. Thanks to our researcher, Jenny Tan, and to our producer, Miranda Schaefer. They are out of this world great. Talk to you soon, Howie. Thanks very much, Harlan. Talk to you soon. 